Hello, welcome to my video. Um, this is just a short little video about this little radio, a big radio. Okay, so it's from 1940s. Um, it's a nice little valve set, it's nothing new. And I just wanted to go over some of the interesting things I found about it. And also, um, perhaps a restoration at some point. I'm not going to be re um, recapping or anything right now. It's very late, I think it's about... Uh, I think it's getting close to 1 o'clock, so I'll 2 o'clock now, so there you go. Right, okay, so, yeah, about 940s. Now, the first things to mention is, um, the cabinet is massive of this, and this is tinsel. <laughs> I just thought I really want to show you the size difference. Uh, it's not that, what is it? It's on the floor somewhere. I'm so I've uh, it's on the floor. I did not plan that very well, did I? It's down there. Um, it's a very, very, it's almost the size of my little tech scope. My, my big tech scope. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a substantial size, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I just wanted to mention that, that was pretty funny, I thought, anyway. So, let's go through it. Uh, right, so that everything works on it, including the um, dial with the tuning condenser. It works absolutely fine. Um, all of it works. This is the volume control here. Um, this here appears to be perhaps the record player um, volume adjustment. It does appear, it has got a record player, won't it, right, in the case? Well, currently it's on the shelf, but um, it does have a record player, right? And I'm pretty sure that is what it's being used for. Um, the wires off that record player actually do go directly to this radio. So it appears to be doing um, that function. Which is pretty strange, but again, I'm not a record player person. <laughs> I really couldn't say. I'm pretty sure they might also be using this as the amplifier for it as well. So mm, I didn't see any other active components on the record player. So yeah. Um, right, so this is the wave switch here. This will sw uh, switch between short wave, medium wave, and long wave. Very typical for, you know, it's just a super heterodyne radio. Um, the tune condenser works, and I think I've already mentioned that, and my camera's going out of focus. Oh no. There you go. Okay, um, and as you, of course you can see, the dial track's just fine. Like the actual, um, pointer. Sorry. I'm gonna just turn around the radio so you can see the back. One second. Hello, welcome back. Okay, and this is the back of the radio, you're saying. Um, as you can see, there's not a whole lot of information. There appears to be a number here, and I was thinking, oh, maybe it's a model number. It doesn't appear to be, so I did look it up. Um, what can I say? I couldn't find anything. Uh, I know the radio is a um, Cossor radio, but other than that, I did look through some of the stock and I didn't find a thing. Or stock, I should say, the, um, off a radio museum website. I couldn't, couldn't find anything. I looked through their type of thing, so. Um, it's out there somewhere. I couldn't find it. It doesn't really matter anyway. It, it's not a big deal. Okay, these are the two IF transformers here. Um, rectifier tube, mixer, perhaps tech die. I haven't actually looked up that um, valve, but I know that's got what it's being used for, the mixer anyway. Uh, slash conversion, whatever you call it. Frequency conversion. Um, this here, I wanted to say was the um, oscillator amplifier, but they usually um, put that into the same tube as the mixer, right? It's that uh, and um, detector. So, again, not entirely sure if that's schematic or looking up the tubes. I haven't done that yet. So, again. Um, okay, this is the audio output tube. I know that for sure. I checked. Um, so, that's the audio output tube. And it isn't um, driving. Well, it's only driving a small speaker. Um, this is the, of course, the audio output transformer. It's being used for that. Okay, as you can see here, this is the tune condenser. It's in brilliant condition. Um, everything works, no shorts on it, no dust. It turns out, I can't see if I can barely reach it, there you go. And as you can see, the condenser moves just fine. It's a bit of dirt on that plate, but it's fine. It's not shorting, I'll clean it now if I need to. Um, okay, welcome back. Okay, this is the underside of the radio. And as you can clearly see, it's um, all point to point. That's no surprise there. It's a bit of a rat's nest. I've definitely seen ones wide better up than that, but there you go. Okay, so it uses a mix of wax capacitors, as you can see. Um, I'm not sure if this capacitor here, which appears like it might be a poly capacitor. And that definitely looks like a later style, so I'm not entirely sure if that's been replaced at some point. The soldering does look a bit new. Uh, if you can see that, it's going... You probably can't. Oh, you just about can. It's going to a solder tag, and that solder looks quite a bit more fresh than the rest. So it seems possible it's been changed um, by the previous owner. Not entirely sure, really. Okay, so of course all these capacitors have to be changed, right? If mine is they're leaking electrically and so um, physically too, some of them, if you're really unlucky. I did actually power this up, however, I moved the rectifier tube to check everything. Maybe I'll show you that. Um, when you power these radios up, it's incredibly important to have an, um, an isolation transformer and variac or a mix of between the two. And current limiting if you can. I was just using an old dim bulb setup. I don't know if you can see that bulb there. Hold this next to it. My little box. Nothing over there. Not very professional, but there you go. Okay, so this is the main field capacitors here. Um, it uses the usual arrangement of a dampening resistor, which would be this guy here, and the two capacitors on either side. I've seen this on all of these radios. Um, I haven't seen one without any choke, actually, which is disappointing. Um, 
they usually, oh sorry, they usually use chokes similar to this, but um, not the high end radios, but of course they didn't, rather this didn't, um, wasn't cost effective, or the radio just wasn't worth that much, so yeah, so it wasn't as cost effective. Okay, so this is the aerial jack here, when it comes through, you can see the um, coupling, condens coupling condenser that goes to the tuning circuit. Um, nothing new there, you've got all the oscillator coil, oh, can you see that, I might be able to turn it up a bit. And of course you've got all the oscillator coils. Can you see that, friends? I think you can. Um, all of them look fine, I did check, and again, it was oscillating. Um, with a ton of noise, however, but there you go. <laughs> it changed. Um, they're using the usual configuration. I could draw it if you like, but it's nothing too fancy. It's just a um, resistor and two capacitors. Hello, welcome back. Okay, so this is basically what they've done here. Um, you've got the B+, plus. it's unfiltered present here. It goes through, um, well I shouldn't say it goes through, but you know what I mean. It gets filled by one um, one capacitor here, goes through the dampening resistor, which is basically used for um, filtering out the small signals. Quite literally it just turns them into heat. It's very inefficient. That's, there you go. And then there's an another capacitor on the output. This kind of forms a um, almost, well, I want to say a pie filter, but you know, <laughs> it's not using an inductor here. Usually this would be an inductor, but they've used a re uh, resistor in this case. It, I'm not sure how hot it gets, judging by, I think that might be a 2 watt package. It probably dissipates a little bit of energy, but there you go, not power, so pardon my language. Anyway, that's the topology they use. So many of these radios use it. I'm not entirely sure why they can't use a choke, um, you know, other than for cost reasons. It feels like there's plenty of room to mount one there, doesn't it? But, hmm, perhaps I could experiment. I have got a choke like I just showed you. Uh, I think it's 40 henlows at uh, 400 mil, not 400 mil, 100 mil ounce. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, other than that, I will be back, and it'll be on the other test bench, and you should see it powering up. Okay, hello, welcome back. Um, this is a continuation of it. Um, well, for you it was instant for me, I had to mess everything around and uh, clean off the table a bit. Okay, so what we're going to do is now, we're going to power up the radio. Now, two things to mention. First of all, I'm putting the rectifier tube, I mean, there will be no B plus uh, present, right? This is really critical, obviously the capacitors are old, and um, there's a very decent chance something will be shorted at some point in the future, if not already. Doing this will prevent any DC voltage present on these capacitors, or any voltage at all. Maybe on the um, couple, maybe a coupling capacitor or two, but um, I'm not too worried about that to the chassis, because it, I am using an isolation variac. Um, this is not a normal variac, by the way, it is an isolated variac, it doesn't quite say in there, but it, I can assure you it is fully isolated and double wound. Uh, Troidal transformer. So yeah, absolutely fine there. I have uh, tested everything, of course. Very important. And this is critical if you're going to be working on any form of valve equipment. Not really anything powered off the mains, uh, let alone something that has just bits and bobs going everywhere. One carrying who knows what type of voltage, okay? So if the chassis does, uh, does become live due to any reason, it isn't nearly as big of a shock hazard. So yeah. Um, this does not mean it's safe, but it also allows you to connect up um, instruments as well. So you don't have to worry nearly as much. Um, it helps avoid ground loops. Hello. So, with that in mind, um, there'll be a cut here, and hopefully everything should be connected up, and I'll be ready to power it out. Okay, welcome back. Okay, so, um, I have pulled the rectifier tube out of there, so there'll be no DC voltage present. And as you can see, I've connected up the variant isolation transformer to the transformer directly. Uh, through the switch, however, so you can see that happen. Um, I usually monitor the current through this, or use a dim bulb, but in this case it shouldn't be necessary. However, this has actually got a um, solenoid cutout, so if the current about over 4 amps get pulled, it will trip that. As well as for fuse, of course, all the usual things. I recommend doing this with a dim bulb system, however, in this case it shouldn't be necessary. But you will get to see if any exciting thing happens. Okay, so let me just make sure that the variac is on the correct voltages. The camera may go everywhere, I do apologise. Uh, that's about right, actually. <laughs> Okay, in a minute. So you shouldn't see anything happen when I do this. There you go. Now, once I flip this little switch here, uh, you should see the um, bulbs come on. And then I'll measure the voltage for you, and I'll show you all my voltmeters meters up there. Okay. Do you want me to turn that up a bit? There you go. There you go. They've lit up. And as you can see, everything is uh, nothing will burst into flames just yet, and that's usually a good sign. So I'll go turn on the meter, and you will see the voltage. Welcome back. I am going to use my other hand for this, I am left handed, so off we go. So the voltmeter has been connected up, of course it's on the right scale, it's auto arranging, it's fine. So I currently got the common of this probe attached to the, um, in this case the centre tap of the transformer, and the above, one above is 280, one below 280. Of course this means across it is actually about 400, you know? so, was it 80? If not that would be about 500, I <laughs> it's quite light. Uh, can you see that? 
You can just about. Okay, without um, blowing something up, uh, give me a second so I can show you this at the same time. Okay, I'm about to touch it. As you can see, about 268 volts. That's about right for being... There you go. There you go. About 270 really. Oh, that's not good content. Very oxidised. I apologise. There you go. Yeah, about 270 volts really. That's correct. It's unloaded. And it's actually really close. Wow. <laughs> Don't usually see them that close. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. 270 volts. That's on the other connection. And that is correct. Um, I have checked all of the other ones. Of course, the filaments are well, off the uh, light bulbs. So that's absolutely fine. If you're wondering, the light bulbs in almost all of this, not all, I wouldn't say always, but it's really, really common to have these bulbs here um, lit off the same supply, the filament supply of the tubes. In fact, they'll probably lit up some of them. You may be able to see that, I won't be able to. Can you see anything? I won't be able to know until I'm editing the video. Um, okay, and so the next thing to do basically would be to recap this first for safety reasons, kind of obvious and of course uh, functional reasons too. <laughs> And it will be then to um, fire it up and water any troubleshooting as needs to be. The last.